All right. Good afternoon, all you uh, What I Crush people. Thank you for being here. I'm super pumped to uh, share with you somebody who I have seen do amazing things. Uh, I've got Miss Carly Lockie here of Remarkable People Solutions. And you know what's funny or interesting? Carly, you are our first guest outside of the real estate industry. You're the first person who has come on What I Crush that wasn't already an agent. Isn't that cool? Um, talk about pressure. Oh yeah, yeah, there's all that too. <laughs> oh, right, right, yeah, okay. No problem, getting my real estate license today per. Yeah. Well, that's actually kind of tough in North Carolina, I've heard, yeah. but we'll work on that, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> thanks. All right, so Carly, let's start with just telling everybody who you are, what you do, why you do it, just give us the intro, okay? Totally will, yeah. And Jordan, thanks for having me. It really is a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and if you want to understand me, you do have to kind of go back to the beginning. But I want to give a short understanding of how my life got going in terms of employment. My first job was when I was probably 10 years old. Um, my dad, who was a preacher, said, well, I've got a job for you. And I started copying um, his sermon illustrations out of books and organizing them to three wing binders made a whopping 50 cents an hour at that job. Um, I think I made $20 that entire summer, went to summer camp, got a t-shirt. Like, you know, I didn't care that the bottom line wasn't anything significant. I just wanted to be a part of something. I wanted to learn. Uh, I ended up helping my brother mow lawns, come to find out he was making money on me. I wasn't getting paid. So the bottom line was not a motivational factor for me. It was just, I wanted to be a part of something cool or something great or something that my mom said I couldn't be a part of, you know, like a riding lawnmower type of scary thing. But my first official job was for Chick-fil-A when I was 15 and for an awesome operator in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, Terry O'Neill. And I just, I thought it was awesome. The culture, how much they cared about people the fast paced environment. They let me just work as hard as I wanted to. And I loved it. So from there, I kind of felt like I loved people, didn't really know what to do about it. So I went into teaching, got my degree, taught school, absolutely loved it. I knew it wasn't for me forever, but it was what I enjoyed at the time. I actually then got another stint at Chick-fil-A when I was in my twenties with another great operator, Patrick Keneally in Moorhead City, North Carolina and realized that people was what I loved and maybe more so out of the classroom than inside of it. Uh, ended up opening some franchise restaurants for a team of investors, learned that people were actually the most difficult part of the job and I just sought to quantify um, how to help build and grow teams and not just have this gut feeling that, hey, this is, this is how I should do it, right? So, Enter Remarkable People Solutions, where I said, oh, 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 okay, we can do that. Well, maybe we can do it for others. And it's been just a blast. It's what I absolutely love to do all day, every day. And I should probably shut up now, so. <laughs> You're good. And um, so Carly, tell us a little bit about what Remarkable People Solutions does and who you ultimately seek to partner with with your company. Yeah, absolutely. We love to partner with industry leaders to help select, hire, and build a growing team. So we are looking for partners, you know, clients who either are crushing it themselves, so they're industry leaders, but maybe they have some things that keep them up at night. One thing may be you don't hire that often, or you don't have an HR person, or you just see you know, the hundreds of resumes coming in and you're like, I don't even want to hit open on one email with a resume on it. I don't even know where to begin. So we partner best with folks who have fears just like we do, but you want to see your risk in the hiring process decreased and your ability to interview folks who are stable and a culture fit for your business interviewed we can increase that ability as well. So those, that's really what we do with people, just helping to select, hire, and then properly engage them in your growing business. Got it. I love that. And um, so Carly, with the, um, you know, I would imagine that outsourcing this, right, when you have team yeah. culture and, uh, you know, other employees, you know, or team members, that it's, it's probably hard to outsource hiring. 
right? Absolutely. So how does somebody actually do that? Like, how does this, how would that even work? Great question, Jordan. Honestly, it, it's scary to me that anyone would ever challenge me to let someone else select my team for me. I'd be like, yeah, heck no. But the bottom line is, is we know a whole lot about people selection and um, what we call their building block assessment, whether or not they're stable. But beyond that, what we know in our area of expertise has to be applied individually to each partner. So if someone says, hey, I think that this is going to be a good fit for us, but you know, I'm not really confident about it yet. Our first step is to seek to clarify, seek to understand. So we end up asking you a whole lot of questions about who you are, how you're trying to build your team, the team you have built, the team you want to build, and we understand exactly who you are. And because we use discernment, we're able to act on your behalf and really embody your culture and find the folks that are going to be a fit for you. So ultimately, we may be people experts in our field, but how it applies to each partner is massively more important to us. And so we spend a lot more time discussing you and who you are and less time talking about us because, well, we're not as cool as you. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's kind of like the career visioning process, right? Like I think it asks and answers really three questions. It's where have you been? Who are you now? And where are you headed? And Good. so it yeah. sounds like what you're talking about, right, is that you guys spend the time first to figure out who this client is as an organization, who they are, what the vision is. And that's a big piece of what you do. Yeah. And in today's world, especially, Jordan, I totally interrupted you, but you knew at least one was coming probably. Um, <laughs> I, in today's world, it is different than it was 15 months ago and certainly different than you know five, 10 years ago. The bottom line is we also need to understand how you're attractive to applicants. And sometimes that's very overt, very obvious. And then sometimes it's not. And then sometimes you failed to advertise that to your applicant pool. And so we do the legwork, bring in the expertise to help you with that. Because ultimately, as far as my team, and just a shout out, I have an amazing, incredible team. Um, as far as my team goes, we have yet to determine how we can create people. So we've not been given that ability yet. So we have to help you find them in your applicant pool. So in today's world, just the pressures of small applicant pools and folks wanting to work from home and just kind of the... the um, issues at hand, we're able to help you wade through that as well. Got it. So when you're looking to hire people, Carly, what is it that you look for in mm. candidates? How do you go about this? That's great. And th that is what really is our proprietary unique tool. We call it a building block assessment. So as I was interviewing folks over the years and trying to understand what made one person fit versus the other, I ended up you know, figuring out what everyone told me, there's no cookie cutter, you know, someone doesn't fit a certain preset of expectations in terms of what they sound like, what they've accomplished in their life, some of that matters, but ultimately it had to be something more than that, and I wanted to understand what that was, and what it ended up being was, um, in our building block assessment, it determines whether or not a, a candidate is stable, and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, there are moments that my husband would tell you I'm not stable and he's not on this recording. So there, but the point is stability is the total um, addition of character plus chemistry plus competency. All three things together assessed leads us to determine if someone is a stable culture fit candidate. We call it a building block team member. Okay, so you're really looking for stability and Correct. stability is made up of character, chemistry, and competency. competency. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So Carly, um, how do you, I know that you've got this building block assessment. So that's one thing is proprietary to what you guys do. But if you're interviewing people, what are the telltale signs of stability? Like what, how does that emerge in the process? That's really good. That's, a, that's such a great question, Jordan. The truth of the matter is we all have the ability to assess people, right? It's what you are assessing is what matters. So I remember the days of um, someone coming in and sitting in front of me and I'm interviewing them 
And all I can think is, yes, they have great availability. I think they can learn this position and they can start tomorrow. That's awesome, right? And then several weeks later, you know, they're running out the back door or telling me they're not willing to do something. And all I'm thinking is, um, do you know what I did for 50 cents an hour? Boring. So the, it really frustrated me when I realized that I didn't actually know the person I was hiring. And so I ended up asking a whole bunch of questions of this person very in a you know, tornado whirlwind until over time, I understood what I was even trying to assess, which in our practice, those are the people's goals, their choices, their view of themselves and their relationship with others. We believe those are the pillars to what make up a person. Okay, so that was pure gold right there, Carly. So share those four pillars with us again and give us a brief uh, definition of what yeah. those four things are. Great. So we have building block principles built around all four of those subject areas, goals being the first one. Now, someone who is stable has set and pursued goals, but also made changes to those goals as necessary. Case in point, Am I a current school teacher? No, but it was my original goal. So either I'm not stable or I made changes to my goals as necessary and I saw and experienced failure as falling forward. So note that the absence of failure is actually not helpful and identifying that someone has failed is not the only thing you should do. You need to understand what they did with it, right? So that's goals, choices. The choices that someone makes needs to be based upon their goals and those choices need to make logical sense, right? Now, we've all made illogical decisions probably in the last 15 months, especially on Amazon. I mean, I, I know what happened, right? Um, but choices overall just need to be in light of the goals. You're pursuing them. You're making changes to those as necessary. And they are not choices that are based upon you feeling victimized or feeling entitled. That's a horse that you got to stay up in the saddle on. If all of us were to be honest with ourselves, we can easily feel like, oh, I deserve this, or oh, I can't believe they did that to me. And some of that's justified. I'm not saying it's not. But on top of the horse, you make the choice of saying, hey, I've got to make choices in light of who, who I should be and who I should not be, right? And then the view of yourself I kind of encompass that already. It is so important to have the right view of yourself, which then in the fourth area leads you to have the right type of relationships with others. And this is super basic, y'all. Folks just having connections with others because without outside connections with others, you're unable to assess yourself. And no one is actually made to be an island unto themselves. That's a scary place to be. I think we can all say that, right? I mean, the pandemic, hopefully did not, but it might have exposed that for some of us where we're like, oh man, I haven't talked to anybody in two weeks outside of whoever, right? So those four areas are extremely important to us and we seek to assess just those four areas. Yeah. And what's interesting about that, Carly, is it's almost like you've got four relationships. It's the relationship mm -hmm. this person has to goals, so the relationship this person has to their choices, mm -hmm. right? And with their choices, it seems like are they reflective enough to see that they live in a cause and effect world that their choices ultimately got them mm -hmm. to where they are today? Or in your words, they're not being quote unquote victimized or mm -hmm. entitled, right? And then the relationship that they have with themselves, because let's face it, you're never going to outperform the opinion you have of yourself over any length of time. And then lastly, the relationship that they ultimately have with others. So what you're saying is those four things kind of make up, how do those fit into the three C's of, um, now I'm going to butcher it, uh, Carly. So this is where your expertise, but mm -hmm. the competency, yep. what were the Yep. So character, chemistry, and competency. So yep. what I just discussed, those four areas, we're actually not rating people on, right? So if I assess you versus Mary Cheatham, I'm not saying that, you know, oh, uh, Jordan has better goals than Mary Cheatham. No, what we're looking for are indicators. And I love, actually, Jordan, you just hit on one of the major indicators 
for us, which is reflect reflective, the ability to be reflective, to reflect on your choices, to see how you need to change or to reflect on your attitude, you know, that rotten, stinky thing that happened once upon a time. Those are the things that we're actually assessing are, are they reflective? Are they respectful? Are they kind? Are they willing, motivated, those types of things. And those are the indicators we're actually assessing because it tells us internally about someone, right? So those indicators then help us to determine if someone is going to be a building block team member for your team. Love that. I love that. Okay. That's brilliant. Carly. And, you know, um, so remarkable people solutions, right? I think we've already heard some of what makes you all unique. And yet there's a lot of headcutting companies out there. There's a lot of approaches to hiring. Yeah. What is it that makes you guys special or different? Yeah. So um, number one, I think what makes us extremely unique is that we do seek to understand first how we apply to you. We want to bring our expertise to the table but how it applies to each partner is just a little bit different. So we talk about the fact that our why is to provide enduring and remarkable relief through custom people and process solutions. The custom is what a lot of folks kind of live for. They want to be, you know, who they are and they want to feel like they are the best or they are kind of um, unique to everyone else. So we, we want to be a part of that. And in order for us to do that, we have to understand who you are and apply our expertise to, to that. Um, but the second thing really is the first part of our why, which is to provide enduring and remarkable relief. Um, I know that too often, because I've walked in shoes, just not real estate shoes, um, but the shoes that I've walked in are um, fear, as a business owner, getting that text that says, hey, can we talk on Thursday? I hate that. I, I Yes, I want to talk on Thursday, but not with the ominous like lack of, hey, here's the agenda, right? Or, or the thoughts that keep me up at night. Do I have enough capacity on my team? Um, does everyone feel cared for? Does, does someone have too much on their plate? What do I do about all this? And it feels so messy and confusion, confusing. But what we do is to provide enduring and remarkable relief. So all of us want to have an enduring organization, right? Like we want to know that what we're doing is going to last and actually matter and be effective. So we want to be a part of that and we want to help you do that, right? We're partners in that. And then the second piece is this, it just really brings remarkable relief where you know, hey, if I partner with RPS, the unique part is that they will decrease my risk in this process. That will help you sleep at night, right? And then we're going to increase your ability to select stable culture fit applicants that truly help you to build your team with these building block team members. Because at the end of the day, if you build your team with building block team members, it doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. People are still messy, right? Case in point, me, okay? My team will tell you it's a little bit messy sometimes. Um, but if you do select building block team members, what you can know is when the pressure of your organization and in the real estate world, it has just exploded, right? I mean, the amount of pressure that has increase because of the opportunity is just astronomical or it feels that way sometimes but that pressure can settle onto an organization with building block team members where it can withstand if there are some gaps or some lack of clarity it can withstand that pressure but if you haven't chosen to build your team in that manner then those little blocks that you thought looked really pretty when they came to the interview, they can actually implode or explode. And you can see how much hurt and problems that that can actually throw onto your organization outside of the singular person. And I do want to stop and identify here very, very briefly, but very importantly, that the reason that we're doing this also is to help the candidate, right? So if this is not a fit for that person, and we know that this is not going to make you know, make their life exactly what they're looking for. It is very important that we help a client not select that person for that applicant's sake as much as the client's sake. So people to us matter, and it's both the, the team that we're working with as well as everyone in the applicant pool. Got it. Okay. Got it. So one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Carly, like when we're back into the into the nitty gritty of this, do you have any like 
favorite questions you like to ask around stability? And I, I don't want you giving away anything proprietary, but I'm sure you have some great questions around stability. Can you think of anything that you really use in the process that would be helpful to the audience? Yes, and, and anything that is proprietary, yes, we're gonna be so proud of it, but it, I certainly have learned it from everyone that's impacted my life. So, I mean, it's mine, but it's not, you know what I'm saying? So the yep. very first question that we love to ask is just to ask the applicant, hey, so why are you looking for employment? Seems so simple. But that question normally helps to move down the road of a can of worms or a can of wonderful, right? They start to crack open the lid and you're like, oh, this is not gonna be sounding very great, is it? Or, oh, like this is really cool, right? And so that question can lead into so many other questions, but a question that we really value, especially in the world of Keller Williams, where y'all are just building these amazing teams is that we wanna understand if, if the leadership style that they are led best by is you. So if I am analyzing um, an applicant for a specific partner, a client, and I ask them the, the question, hey, so of all the jobs that you have held, tell me, tell me about a job that you really enjoyed working at because of the way the leadership team led you. And then I'm listening to see if the leadership team they're describing is reflective of the company that we are analyzing to see if it's a fit, right? And then we've just flipped the question around and there are no trick questions, no questions that we're trying to bait someone into saying something bad. We truly wanna understand, hey, of all the jobs that you have held, what job did you not necessarily enjoy because of the way the leadership team led you? And then that helps us to understand the inverse, which you actually normally learn a lot more from. So just in a, in a real quick snapshot, those are some questions that we really enjoy asking. Yeah. And I think that those probably tell you like how they relate to others. And, you know, that yes. I can see how it all just layers right yes. on top of those four areas. That makes sense. So, um, okay. So Carly, when I was preparing for this, I found this quote, it actually popped out at me so much and I loved it because uh, I put it in last week's newsletter, but it's from Keith Cunningham. And it says, this is a little long, but it says the caliber of your team is the single most important component of successfully and efficiently operating the machine. And yet it is the one element where business owners tend to make exceptions and tolerate mediocrity. Hmm. And what I'm curious about is what are some of the biggest mistakes or mishaps that you see business owners making when it comes to selecting? I like selecting better than hiring. Yeah, we, that is actually what we like as well. We call ourselves selection specialists. Um, so uh, just being a past English teacher, the word caliber can be a little bit confusing because of the context, but I think a really great synonym would be capacity. So you know, the capacity, um, if you're a really great organization and you're hiring these awesome folks who have really high capacity, I can say both from personal experience and personal observation, which I think both are extremely valuable. Maybe one is more personal to me, but observation, you cannot um, lessen the value of it. If you're hiring an amazing team that has a great capacity, you can ruin your own team. And you may blame it on your team, but ultimately the culture and the responsibility falls on you. And if you truly are a visionary and the where the rubber meets the road is not your thing, that's fine. But someone in your organization needs to be tasked with uh, the, the engagement of your team. And if I was to tell you nothing else other than two things that could help you get this huge capacity, these building block team members that are gonna you know, just help to run the world, in your organization, uh, if you do if you do fail to give them ownership and accountability, you have not engaged their full capacity or their caliber, as Jordan referenced. And the way that this looks really easy and difficult is that visionaries love giving ownership, and and I have benefited from that, right? Uh, I've had several visionary bosses who just gave me ownership and I was willing to try, right? Like, so I have significantly benefited from that. Um, but where I am really great, and I've learned this over the years, is, is not necessarily the ownership piece, but the second one, which is accountability. And that word has such a negative connotation because 
I mean, for those of you who have kids, for those of you who had to terminate an employee recently, like it just leaves a bad taste in your mouth because, you know, you have to hold them accountable. They didn't make their bed and now you got to talk to them and they throw their big fit over it. Like this is ridiculous, right? The point being accountability is actually to the positive if you use it all the time. So if you give people ownership of something and then you say, hey, I'm going to be checking back to make sure that you're doing this and you're doing it to the capacity or the caliber that I know you can, then it's to the positive. Because if you're selecting building block team members, more than likely they actually want structure and accountability and they want to be appreciated. And how do you appreciate them if there is not a structure, right? So actually everyone craves structure. Uh, there's a couple people on this phone call that would seem that they're not loving structure, but one amazing visionary told me last week that she actually secretly loves structure. We all do, we're made for it, right? So the point being that you have to have accountability so that you can get the capacity out of your team. But then also that accountability is there so that you can use it to the other side where you have to kind of kick someone in the butt or you know, allow the system to kick you in the butt because you weren't doing what you were supposed to be doing. So ownership and accountability, if you lack either one or both, you know, there was no reason to build a great team to begin with because you probably will have minimized the capacity. Mm, got it. So those are the things like when it's not just about selecting someone, like mm. once you get them, you've got to be clear on what they own and then it's holding them accountable or holding them able, right? Yeah. I think Good. Brene Brown's uh, quote of clear is kind is really relevant here. So yes. being clear on it and then being it sounds like consistent. And, mm. you know, in my own experience, Carly, the reason that people aren't consistent with accountability is because they're not playing the game the way that they want their team to, so that it feels hypocritical. I, I do think, think I mean, we can all say that is one area. Another one is accountability is just hard. It's consistency is hard, right? So um, when, if you check yourself, it's either because you're scared you're going to be exposed or you just have to admit it's actually hard and you don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I love that. So, um, all right, Carly. So what have I not asked you today that I should have? Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Big question. Um, great question. So why, why am I doing this? Okay, let's just start there. We already answered it, but in brief, the reason that I'm doing this is because I absolutely love solving people problems. And if someone calls me, I'm going to want to partner with you and solve your people problems. But number two, it's going to come with a lot of transparency. It's not BS. Um, and, it's, and it's also not high criticism. It is literally just my desire to help you not just deal with the bad fruit, if you will, but to deal with the root of the problem, because I can help you all day feel better about your problems and tell you the bad fruit doesn't smell as bad or taste as bad as it, it does. Um, but if I help you with the root of the problem, then I've helped you with enduring and remarkable relief, right? So why am I doing this? It certainly is not for the bottom line. It's because this is what I love to do. And um, if I have folks who are industry leaders and they really do want to make a change and they're willing to be honest with themselves and others, I mean, those folks, man, I just love being a part of their organization. Yeah. And I can say just as a, you know, an observer of your work, Mary Cheatham King Real Estate, their team and the, the people that you have brought into that organization are amazing, amazing talent. And if anybody on this call wants to reach out to you about your services or working with you, what's the best way for them to do that, Carly? So write a letter. I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. That was once upon a time. We did that. Y'all remember those days we wrote letters to each other? Go to my website, remarkablepeoplesolutions.com. Not too hard. Or you can go to wesolvepeopleproblems.com. That one's fun. It's the same website. Uh, and, and there you can hit the connect button and you actually can get a Calendly time slot with me, um, my leadership team and I, and we would love to just chat with you. When you do sign up for the Calendly, it asks you a couple of questions that are helpful for you to determine if we're a fit for you. And we think it's just really important that you reflect on those first. So um, would love, yeah, I would love to chat with anyone. You can't tell it, but I do like to talk. So I'd love to talk with you. 
<laughs> All right. Well, it is the bottom of the hour, Carly, and we thank you so much for pouring into us. I know that I've learned a lot today and I've talked to you several times. So every yeah. time it seems like I get you somewhere, I end up with a page of notes. So thank oh, you. Stop. It's likewise, Jordan. I really appreciate and respect all that you're doing. Thank you so much, Carly. And uh, for those of you who are still with us next week, we'll be on. We're going to be doing first time home buyers seminars with Kimberly Meserve. That will be at a new time, May 3rd at four o'clock Eastern, three o'clock Central. So check us out on the next episode of What I Crush. And again, thank you for our time, Carly. Everybody have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye -bye. Thanks, Jordan. Hi there, and thank you for watching What I Crush. And if you're enjoying what we're putting down, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe. Don't forget the bell button. And check us out at whaticrush.com. We'll see you on our next episode.